The Philippine National Police says 27 alleged narco politicians won in the recent last midterm elections. The Commission on Elections hopes to proclaim winning senators and party list groups this week. Malacanang orders National Youth Commission Chairman Ronald Giancarlo Cardema to vacate his post amid pending party list bid. And doctors in the United Kingdom operate on a baby's spine while inside his mother's womb. Good evening. The chief of the Philippine National Police says there are candidates in the recently concluded midterm elections in the country who are included on the so-called narco list. Leia Ilagan will tell us why. The Philippine National Police, or PNP, will investigate and build up cases against 27 alleged narco politicians who won in the 2019 midterm elections. In a press briefing at Camp Krame today, PNP Chief Police General Oscar Albayalde said that there are 47 politicians included in the so-called narco list. 37 of them ran for electoral posts during the recently concluded 2019 national and local elections and 27 of them won. Well, continuous naman yung pag-iimbisiga sa kanila. And uh, as the, the, the SILG have said, pag merong nakitang mga ebidensya laban sa kanila, they'll be uh, filed uh, cases, both criminal and uh, administrative. Albayalde added that mayors and governors in Luzon are among the so-called narco-politicians who won in the recent polls. General Albayalde says the Department of Interior and Local Government or the DILG will be handling the case against those local government executives involved in illegal drugs. Sa Luzon meron. Dito lang sa 4 uh, sa, sa 3 meron, sa 4A meron. Kilala ko yung mga nandun sa yung mga nasa listahan dun sa ano, alam ko yung mga pangalan nila. Uh, alam ko nanalo yung mga yun eh doon sa nakalista doon sa 4A at saka sa 3 meron Leia Ilagan UNTV News and Rescue Camp Krame The Senate Blue Ribbon Committee sought for an investigation on the midterm elections victory of 26 politicians included in the so-called narco list in a statement Senator Richard Gordon, who heads the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee, said that there was an ordinate, flagrant, and scandalous vote buying in the areas where the alleged narco politicians won. Gordon said an extensive investigation should be conducted by different agencies such as the Commission on Elections, Anti Money Laundering Council, the Bureau of Internal Revenue, the National Bureau of Investigation, and the Philippine National Police. Malacanang confirms that former chairperson of the National Youth Commission or NYC, Ronald Cardema, abandoned his position when he filed a petition for substitution before the Commission on Elections or COMELEC as first nominee of the Duterte Youth Party list. Presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo said Cardema did not seek permission from the office of the president and he is deemed resigned from his post. Comelec has no decision yet on Cardema's petition. The palace has also ordered Cardema to turn over all official papers, documents, and properties in the possession to the office of the president. Malacanang isn't sure if Cardema can be held legally liable after abandoning his NYC chairmanship. Well, as far as we're concerned, he showed his disinterest in further serving the executive branch then. Who are we to stop him? The Senate of the Philippines, which is part of the legislature of the country, is composed of personalities from different walks of life. Let us know who are the people that have earned their seats in the Philippine Senate, as Mon Hokson reports. Since 1916, the Philippines has had an active legislature. The Philippine legislature is composed of Senate being the upper chamber and the House of Representatives being the lower chamber. Through many battles and a lot of occurrences, the legislative branch of the Philippines has endured through the years. Each member of both houses is elected through an election. But how is Senate different since its establishment up to this day? Based on history, 
lawyers, and known politicians or leaders in the society won their posts in the Senate. Some of these senators even became President of the Philippines. They were Manuel Alquezon, Jose P. Laurel, Sergio Osmeña, Manuel Rojas, Elpidio Quirino, Carlos P. Garcia, Ferdinand Marcos, Joseph Estrada, Gloria Arroyo, and Benigno Aquino III. The Senate is not exclusive to the male gender. The first woman senator of the Philippines was Jeronima Tomelden Pexon, an educator and social worker who was elected in the 1947 senatorial elections. Over the years, not only lawyers, military officials, and community leaders had been elected as senators. In 1957, Rogelio de la Rosa became the first actor who won a seat in the Senate. He was followed by the Estradas, father and son Ramon and Bong Revilla, Freddy Webb, Tito Soto, and Lito Lapid. Several members of the media also ran and won in the past elections, such as broadcaster Soc Rodrigo, youngest war correspondent Benigno Ninoy Aquino Jr., and news anchors Noli De Castro and Loren Legarda. Several gold collar workers, sports persons, and even businessmen also entered the world of politics in the upper house, such as Dr. Juan Flavier, professional basketball player Robert Jaworski, and couple Manny and Cynthia Villar. In the May 13, 2019 midterm elections in the Philippines, personalities from show business, sports, and business joined the race to a seat in the Senate. The statement of senatorial candidate to retire General Ronald Bato de la Rosa has recently been the talk of town. According to Bato, he wants to learn about the system and process of creating a law. This statement of the ex-police official earned both criticisms and support. Others even cited the situation then of former President Corazon Aquino, who had in her hands the highest political position in the country even without any experiences in politics. On this, De La Rosa has rebutted and dared to have his intelligence quotient or IQ tested by his detractors. This week, the Commission on Elections may proclaim the 12 winning senatorial candidates. The result of the recent polls is proof that since then until now, the Senate is not exclusive to only one profession, study, or origin of a person. As long as majority of the Filipinos vote for a senatorial candidate, he or she is sure to gain a rightful seat in the Senate of the Philippines. Mon Hokson, UNTV News and Rescue. Doctors in the United Kingdom were successful to repair the spine of a baby while it was still inside the womb. Jovic Bermas will tell us why. In a UK first, doctors have used keyhole surgery to repair the spine of a baby with spina bifida while it was still inside the womb. Sherry Sharp, who was once told she could not have children, had the operation performed on her son Jackson at King's College Hospital in London 27 weeks into her pregnancy. I was told I couldn't have children and then, um, and then I fell pregnant with him and it was, it, was, um, it was a very high-risk pregnancy from the start anyway. Spina bifida is a type of neural tube defect that happens when the spinal cord does not develop properly in utero and the nerves are exposed to amniotic fluid leading to problems with the bowel, bladder and legs. Fetal medicine expert Dr. Marta Santorum Perez, who operated on baby Jackson, said that many patients who are given a spina bifida diagnosis for their baby opt for termination of the pregnancy or undergo open womb surgery. So we use three very small tubes, plastic tubes, that go um, uh, into the uterus. Uh, we don't need to open uh, the maternal abdomen, so we just make th very small incisions and we put the plastic uh, tubes, we put a camera inside and two instruments and we can operate, we can put the patch on top of the nerves and we can switch the skin on top. Dr. Santorum Perry said the new procedure was not a cure for spina bifida, but would certainly improve the future life of babies born with the condition. Baby Jackson arrived early at 33 weeks and was looked after in neonatal intensive care at King's. But Sherry hopes that the operation has given Jackson the best start in life. I want to speak out about it and make sure that 
other mums know and other parents know there is a different way of of actually having the surgery and you know it's less invasive and all you have to do is look at him it's just you know we didn't think we'd get this far and it's <laughs> it's just amazing yeah it really is um, we made the right decision yeah in the end Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, London, United Kingdom. The Department of Health is now investigating the reported fake vinegar sold in the country. Ray Palayo tells us why. The Department of Health or DOH promises to act on the reported fake vinegar being sold in the market. The Philippine Nuclear Research Institute or PNRI reported on May 10, 2019 that 8 out of 10 of the more than 360 vinegar samples they tested across the country are made of synthetic acetic acid. DOH Undersecretary Eric Domingo said that there are around 274 brands of vinegar registered in the Food and Drug Administration or FDA. Uh, FDA, ang classification natin kailangan dyan sa so, natural fermentation, yung acetic acid. So kung totoo na meron mga brand dyan na gumagamit nila ng synthetic na acetic acid din, merong mali no, sa kanilang labeling at saka sa kanilang pagkakisro uh, at uh, kailangan natin talagang pagkakasigahan. Retailers in Kamuning Market in Quezon City make sure they sell branded vinegar However, they are not sure if those are the kind of vinegar allowed by authorities to be sold in the market. Ang gusto po nilang mangyari, dapat po lahat ng mga tinitinda namin mga suka at toyo, may mga brand na po siya. May mga label, may nakalagay na expiration date, at saka may nakalagay po siya kung ano yung mga ingredients. Ida Reloba, who sells viands, uses branded vinegar in her products. She said she assures her customers the vinegar she uses is not fake, since the 1980s. Wala naman nagreklamo sa akin sa ano eh, lasa. Agriculture Secretary Manny Pinyol wants the public to be warned about the findings of the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute or PNRI and make a pull out of the vinegars from the market. Pinyol advises the public to buy vinegar that is made from natural ingredients like nipa, coconut, and sugar cane. The DOH for their part said they may order such action Upon confirmation of the PNRI's test. Kapag takit natin na talagang yung testing ay hindi sila pasado din, kailangan natin manotify yung mga kumpanya na hindi sumusunod sa panuntunan para po maipun out ang kanilang produkto. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. A full-scale investigation will be launched to determine the exact cause of the LRT collision on Saturday night, injuring 34 passengers. Nina Armilio will tell us why. The management of the Light Rail Transit Authority, or LRTA, has ordered the creation of a fact-finding committee that will investigate the train crash incident on Saturday. More than 30 people were injured on Saturday evening after a train parked on the pocket track near Anona Station moved on its own and headed toward the main railways eastbound to Cubao. The Trains Control Center noticed the movement of the parked train and immediately notified the approaching train, but it was too late for it to make a full stop. For unknown reason, which is still the subject of, uh, will be the subject of uh, further investigation through a fact finding, which is being instructed by the administrator, uh, gumalaw yung uh, supposedly na sirana train. It was mid afternoon the next day, Sunday, when the LRT2 services resumed. In an interview, LRTA spokesperson Hernando Cabrera said part of the investigation is to determine what caused a dead train to move on its own. Meanwhile, Malacanang ensures the liability of those responsible behind the LRT2 train collision. Uh, the president is concerned. That's why he's waiting for the result of the investigation. The why is the wherefores of the accident. So including yung possible accountability? Yes, of course. The LRTA management and the Department of Transportation assure the public that what happened was an isolated case, while measures are being set up to prevent a repeat of the incident. Uh, kung mababawasan ho yung mga tumatakbong LRT, natural may epekto ho yan. 
Pero uh, sa ganang uh, management, titignan ho lahat yan para na sa ganun, yung uh, apekto sa operasyon ay hindi unnecessarily uh, wide and uh, deep. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. Motorists are advised to prepare for an increase in prices of petroleum products this week. Local oil industry players on Monday announced that the price of diesel will go up by 80 centavos per liter, gasoline by 90 centavos per liter, and kerosene by 75 centavos a liter. The pump price hike will take effect on Tuesday, May 21. Oil firms said the oil price increase is implemented to reflect prices in the world market. The fuel price hike comes after two rounds of rollbacks this month. The Senate will prioritize the passage of the anti-endo and anti-terrorism bills as well as the amendments to the anti-wiretapping law before the 17th Congress begins. Neil Maribohok will tell us why. The Congress session resumed this afternoon before which the Senate held a caucus According to Senate Majority Leader Juan Miguel Zubiri, they tackled some of the priority bills they target to approve before the 17th Congress ends. So, ang priority namin ay uh, pinag-usapan namin doon ang ENDO. Tatapusin na namin yung ENDO for our Filipino workers. Uh, also, amendments to the uh, anti-terror bill, yung Human Security Act. Uh, para sa ganun, lalo na kami sa mga taga Mindanao, areas ng Mindanao, gusto na namin pumawala o malit ang martial law at yan ang hinihingi ng ating military um, leaders na ma-amend po natin yung uh, Human Security Act. And then we'll also prioritize the Anti-Wiretapping Act amendments. On another note, Senator Zubiri said the Senate leaders will be retained in the next Congress which opens on July 22, 2019. This is what they agreed upon during their meeting with Bongo, Francis Tolentino, former PNP Chief Ronald Bato de la Rosa and Bong Revilla in a dinner hosted by Senator Manny Pacquiao last Saturday. The said personalities are in the Magic 12 of the senatorial race. The discussions were to retain Senator Soto for Senate President uh, and uh, myself as your um, Majority Leader and Senator Ralph Recto as Senate President pro tem. Who will lead the vacant committee chairmanship in the Senate was also discussed in the said meeting. Given that four of the senators will end their term and some re-electionists may fail to sit for another term. According to Zubiri, Senator Sani Angara may handle the Committee on Finance. He said Bongo requested to lead the Committee on Health. Senator Panfilo Lacson meanwhile gave up the Committee on Public Order and Dangerous Drugs to be possibly handled by Bato de la Rosa. According to Senate President Vicente Soto III, by tradition, the incumbent and veteran senators will be retained in the committee chairmanship. Yes, um, the general agreement was equity of the incumbent. It's the tradition anyway. Unless uh, one decides to relinquish his or her position or uh, chairmanship, we uh, support the equity of the incumbent rule. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Lower House is set to conduct graduation rites for last-termer congressmen and to acknowledge all the members of the 17th Congress. Grace Cassin will tell us why. The 17th Congress is three weeks away from closing. Of the 294 members of the House of Representatives, more than 70 are serving their last terms as congressmen. During the Senate D adjournment on June 5, the lower house of Congress will acknowledge all the last termers together with all members of the 17th Congress. Last week, the lower house conducted a rehearsal for the graduation program. In a message sent by Deputy Speaker Frederick Abweg to UNTV News, he congratulates his colleagues who have worked very hard for the successful of 16th and 17th Congress. Among the last three congressmen is former Majority Leader Rudy Farinas, who withdrew his gubernatorial race in Olocos Norte two weeks before the 2019 midterm elections. In a statement, Farinas says he wants to have a private life and to be with his grandchildren after his last term. One of his daughters will replace as the representative of the 1st District of Ilocos Norte. Former House Speaker Feliciano Belmonte Jr. also wants to retire from politics as he is on his last term. Now he is 82 years old, 
36 of those spend in politics. Also among the graduating members of the lower chamber is House Speaker Gloria Arroyo. She did not run for any position in the recent polls. She also refused to endorse anyone to be the next House Speaker, as she is not going to be part of the next Congress. Mike Arroyo, son of House Speaker Arroyo, will replace her as a representative of the 2nd District of Pampanga. The names Lord Alan Velasco, Martin Romualdez, Alan Peter Cayetano, Pantalon Alvarez, and Lucy Torres have surfaced recently as the possible next leader of the House of Representatives. The opening of the 18th Congress will be on July 22, 2019, the day of President Rodrigo Duterte's fourth State of the Nation address. Grace Cassin, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. Davao del Norte 1st District Representative Pantaleon Alvarez confirms today that he plans to reclaim the House Speakership in the 18th Congress. Alvarez said he wants to push for the passage of federalism and the reinstatement of the death penalty in the country. He added they haven't talked to President Rodrigo Duterte after the elections. He also said he believes that he still has the support of the members of the lower house to be a House Speaker again. Gusto kong makatulong no, doon sa uh, last half ng uh, administrasyon. Yung uh, sa akin nga, uh, ano, yung personal priorities ko, no? balik ko ulit, yung, uh, yung naipasa namin noon na uh, death penalty, uh, i-re-refile ko ulit yun kasi hindi nga inaprobahan ng Senado yun, hindi inaksyonal. Malacanang insists that President Rodrigo Duterte is in good health condition and the public has nothing to worry about. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. President Rodrigo Duterte wants the people to draw their own conclusions regarding his health. This was the statement of presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo following reports on social media that the president was allegedly confined in Cardinal Santos Medical Center in San Juan City due to cardiac or respiratory arrest last weekend. Presidential spokesperson also said that when he asked the president himself about the issue, President Duterte did not regard it as a serious matter. Instead, the president regarded those reports as gossips. Sa kanya, neither confirm nor deny. You draw your own conclusions. Para sa kanya, it's not, it's not a serious matter. Kasi kung serious yon, he always tell the public about it. The president's voice was also upbeat when the two talked over the phone, the Malacanang official added. The palace also insists that with the president having no public engagements, it does not mean it has something to do with his health or medical condition. Ang presidente, pag hindi nyo nakikita, nagtatrabaho yon. ayaw na i-istorbo yun. Kasi pag, pag nasa labas siya, ang, ang daming gustong makausap sa kanya. Di ba? Eh, napakabait niya naman taon, hindi naman tumatanggi. So, yung focus niya sa kanyang signing papers, reading documents, memo, hindi niya magawa. Kaya siguro, he decides to stay put. And to refute the reports, former Special Assistant of the President Bongo even released pictures of the President reading the dailies yesterday and eating his meal. Malacanang ensures President Duterte himself will report to public about his self-condition when necessary. Let me assure the nation that if there is anything wrong with the president's health serious enough to be of our concern, he will tell us. And he said so himself. Did Many you... times over. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue, Malacanang. Mustache and beard stylists gather in Antwerp, Belgium, proudly displaying their extravagant facial hairstyle. Nina Armilio will tell us why. Mustache and beard aficionados from all over the globe competed in Antwerp, Belgium on Saturday in the 2019 World Beard and Mustache Championship. Hundreds of hairy men participated in the 2019 edition of the competition in categories such as Imperial Mustache. Freestyle mustache, natural full beard more than 30 centimeters, and musketeer. American Lucio Batista, also known as Mustache Ninja, and was hailed the first place winner in the freestyle category of mustache, said that his octo stash is unprecedented. 
So the inspiration actually comes from a bearding legend. His name is Arne, and he's here today. So he has an octo beard. And I said, I want to try to see if I could do an octo stash. Since I don't think it's ever been done before, and I wanted to give it a shot. So here it is today. Other winners include Gary Faulkner, who got the third prize in the freestyle category of full beard, and Anthony Cardi, the second place winner in the freestyle category of partial beard. I create something different every time I compete, never the same thing. So I, uh, yeah, I try to really just use my comb over beard and uh, create something new that's never been done. You can see there's a couple, couple circles I got up there. It took a little bit of time. Um, yeah, I just like try to create something that's not really uh, been done before. This, this inspiration, honestly, I came here with a whole different theme in mind, uh, but I got told last night that I can't do it, otherwise I'd be disqualified. So I just came up with this totally random this morning. I don't know, I woke up. I was, I was so sick this morning too. And then I just got lucky, really. I don't know. It's crazy. The championship has been held every two years in a different country since 1995. Beard and mustache enthusiasts will meet for the next competition in Auckland, New Zealand in 2021. Nina Armillo, UNTV News and Rescue. The Commission on Elections, or COMELEC, hopes to proclaim the winning senatorial candidates and party list groups on Tuesday. Aiko Miguel will tell us why. The winning senatorial bets and party's organizations in the 2019 midterm elections may be proclaimed on Tuesday, May 21, the Commission on Elections or COMELEC said on Monday. COMELEC spokesperson director James Jimenez said the poll body, which sits as the National Board of Canvassers, has yet to complete the canvassing of votes as certificates of canvas from several areas are yet to come in. Out of the total 167 COCs, the NBOC still awaiting five COCs from Japan. The King Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Abuja in Nigeria. The said COCs to be canvassed are equivalent to the votes of 1,683,938 registered voters. Comelec conducted a special election for national and local positions in Jones Isabela after vote counting machines and ballots deployed there were intentionally torched and destroyed during the May 13 polls. 762 registered voters were expected to vote in the special election elections in the town today. I'd like to point out that we're not the ones hurrying the proclamation. In fact, some people are complaining that we're taking too much time. Um, meron kasing mga nananawagan ng early proclamation. And if you notice, we have resisted that so far. Comelec Director for Education and Information Department, Attorney Francis Arabe, earlier said the poll body wanted to complete the canvassing of votes before holding a one-day proclamation ceremony. She added that winning party list groups may be proclaimed in the morning of Tuesday, while the senators elect may be proclaimed in the afternoon. The commission and bank wants a 100% proclamation. We will try our best to canvas all the COCs so we can only have one event for the proclamation of the senators and the party list as well. It will be done in one day but uh, separate schedule. So, um, party list will be done in the morning and the senatorial and the clock proclamation for the senators will be in the afternoon. Comelec has also explained earlier that defective secure digital cards used in overseas voting have delayed the canvassing of votes by a week. Arabi said the replacements of corrupted SD cards have to come from their warehouse hub in Santa Rosa, Laguna. With the new SD cards, the Comelec Office for Absentee Voting hopes for a smooth transmission of results in order to complete the canvassing of votes. The NBOC met at 1.42 p.m. on Monday but the canvassing was suspended immediately as there was no CO to canvas. The board was set to resume the canvassing of votes tonight. I go Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Meanwhile, the Parish Pastoral Council for Responsible Voting or PPCRV confirms that a bottleneck in the transparency server caused a seven-hour delay in displaying poll results on the May 13 election day. The group, however, says Comelec must divulge what caused the actual delay. 
Mai Bermudez will tell us why. Based on initial findings of their information technology or IT experts, Election Watchdog Parish Pastoral Council for Responsible Voting or PPCRV confirms a bottleneck was experienced by Commission on Elections or Comelec Transparency Servers causing the seven-hour delay in displaying election results on the day of May 13 elections. A file transfer manager which provides data presented on tally boards failed and did not complete its task on the night after the first transmission of results was shown according to their findings. What we can tell you is that again data was transmitting, number two that data was complete and number three we did observe that there was this bottleneck. The PPCRV is not in a position to declare or to conclude why the bottleneck happened. But the PPCRV confirms data were entering from 6.15 in the evening of May 13 up until 1.19 a.m. of May 14. But Siskomelec has to answer what caused the actual delay during that time. Yes, we saw signs in the logs that that is in fact uh, was happening. But what we are not saying is what caused it. I think the Comelec will have to tell the public what caused the bottleneck. On Friday, the pull body granted access to logs in their transparency server to probe what caused such incident. But when asked if an election fraud exists after this incident, PPCRV Chairperson Myla Villanueva said they are not in the position to answer this and instead ask Comeleg to explain given that they handle the said application. It can be recalled that election observers expressed alarm after seeing no movements in the partial unofficial counts after releasing initial results of 0.38% clustered precincts at 6.15 p.m. of May 13. Comelec explained an application pushing the data from transparency server to PPCRV terminals and media networks experienced an error. But the PPCRV demanded for transmission router logs and a copy of data from Comelec's central server and also asked the media and other election watchdogs to also do counter-checking. My Bermuda, ZUN TV News and Rescue, Manila. The Commission on Elections stands firm that the transmission of election results is faster with the automated election system in spite of all the glitches experienced during the recently held elections. Aiko Miguel explains why. Opinions once again arise on the use of the manual counting of votes because of the different glitches experienced during the elections, which caused some to doubt the result of the recently held midterm elections. The National Citizens Movement for Free Elections, or NAMFREL, is one of those pushing for the idea of bringing back the manual counting of votes in precincts, but with automated canvassing. According to the Commission on Elections, or COMELEC, the Congress will need to amend Republic Act 8436 or an act authorized the Commission on Elections to use an automated election system in the May 11, 1998 national or local elections to implement manual counting of votes. That is the prerogative of Congress. Uh, as far as the COMELEC is concerned, thus far, naging successful naman yung elections natin. Despite the glitches during the elections like the 1,665 corrupted SD cards, 961 defective vote counting machines, and millions of marking pens, and the denunciation of the transparency of the elections, the poll body stands firm that the transmission of election results have been faster with the automated election system. Comelec emphasizes that proof of this is the comparison between the transmission of election results in the previous elections and that in the 2019 midterm elections. Proclamation is, is proceeding faster. Uh, transmission uh, is more complete now. Uh, I think in 2010 we had like only about 90% transmission and then it was 92-93% in, in 2013. In 2016 it was even higher. Now I think PPCRV is reporting 98%. Na, diba? so, so yeah, it's, it's getting better. Director Jimenez also said that as years pass by, the poll body is becoming more prepared for the possible problems which may arise in future elections in the country. We are dealing with the same devices, right? Uh, the same machines. We're dealing with essentially the same system. Um, and, and we are experiencing fewer problems now than we did before. 
Jimenez added that it is the poll body's obligation to make system work more efficiently and more organized, especially in the upcoming 2022 presidential elections. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Malacanang supports a proposal to review the agreement between the Philippines and Kuwait on the rights protection of overseas Filipino workers or OFW. Several migrant rights advocates appeal to the government to review the Memorandum of Agreement or MOA between the two countries as well as its implementation. This after a recent report on the alleged abuse of and murder of a Filipino household service worker in Kuwait. At the moment, the palace awaits the detailed report of the Department of Labor and Employment on the case. I think we should because according to Secretary Bellio, there has been a breach in the agreement signed by the two countries. And for the news abroad, here's Pauline Umpiko live from Tokyo, Japan. Pauline, good evening. Good evening, Will. Huawei said on Monday it would continue to provide security updates and services for its smartphones and tablets after being barred from Google updates to its Android operating system. But it did not say what would happen with phones it would sell in the future, which are unlikely to have access to Google's popular services, including Gmail, YouTube, and Chrome, unless a special license is obtained. Huawei's devices in its home market do not have Google Apps, but the move will hugely damage the brand's appeal to consumers outside China. Almost half of the 208 million phones Huawei shipped in 2018 went to outside mainland China. In Europe, as the most important overseas market where its devices currently have 29% market share, according to technology research firm IDC. Google said it would enact restrictions on Android updates to Huawei after U.S. President Donald Trump on Thursday added a Chinese company to a trade blacklist, making it extremely difficult for it to do business with U.S. counterparts. Australia's Conservative Coalition secured an outright parliamentary majority following a shock election victory, allowing Prime Minister Scott Morrison to progress his legislative agenda without the support of independents. Amiel Pasquale explains why. Australian Prime Minister Morrison's coalition defied forecast to be re-elected on Saturday in what he called a political miracle. The Australian Electoral Commission or AEC on Monday said Morrison's coalition has won 76 seats in Australia's parliament, which is comprised of 151 elected lawmakers. The AEC said the coalition was ahead in one of the three seats that have not been declared. Australian Broadcasting Corporation election analyst Anthony Green said the Morrison's coalition would retain its lead in at least one more seat, allowing it to select a parliamentary speaker and still retain a majority. The results sent Australian banking, property and health-related stocks to an 11-year high on Monday as investors cheered. After a long and bitter election campaign, Morrison said Australians have had enough of politics. We're going to get back to work for the Australians that we know go to work every day, who face those struggles and trials every day. They're looking for a fair go and they're having a go and they're going to get a go from our government every single day. They are who we'll have right in front of us as we put in place and continue the policies which we know will keep our economy strong, to guarantee the essentials that Australians rely on, that will keep Australians safe and secure, and most importantly, most importantly, that will keep Australians together. We are an amazing country of amazing people. God bless Australia. One of Morrison's first tasks after being sworn in will be a cabinet reshuffle after the retirement of several front benchers. The personal shift will be closely watched for signs of policy changes. Morrison has rejected efforts to increase the use of renewables to generate electricity, arguing it would damage the economy, which relies on coal-fired power and mining exports. The coalition is stuck to an official target to cut carbon emissions by 26 to 28% from 2005 levels by 2030. 
but the United Nations has warned Australia was unlikely to meet this goal. The defeated opposition Labour Party campaigned on more aggressive targets, aiming to cut carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 and reach 50% renewable power by 2030. The re-elected Liberal-led coalition has no renewable energy target beyond 2020. Biel Pascual, UNTV News and Rescue. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is likely to return to power with an even bigger majority in parliament. Gahdu Maraos will tell us why. The final phase of India's general election drew to a close on Sunday, with exit polls predicting that Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ruling alliance likely to win a big majority in parliament. Modi's National Democratic Alliance is projected to win anything between 339 to 365 seats in the 545-member Lower House of Parliament with the Congress Party-led Opposition Alliance at a distant 77 to 108, India Today Access exit poll showed. To rule, a party needs to win 272 seats. Modi's alliance won 336 seats in the 2014 election. The exit polls showed that he not only held to this base in the northern Hindi belt, but also breached the east where regional groups traditionally held sway. Counting of votes recorded in hundreds of thousands of computerized machines will begin early on Thursday and results are expected by noon. According to another poll released by today's Chanakya, Modi's alliance is likely to get around 350 seats. One poll by Neta News X, though, forecasts Modi's group falling 30 seats short. Exit polls, though, have a mixed record in a country with an electorate of 900 million people, around two-thirds of whom voted in the seven-phase election. They have often gotten the number of seats wrong, but the broad direction has generally been correct, analysts say. Gat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, Will. Thank you very much, Pauline Ompiko, reporting live from Tokyo, Japan. Thousands of cyclists took to the streets of Moscow on Sunday. Meanwhile, Bayern Munich win their seventh Bundesliga title. Ferdi Pitalio tells us why. A record 40,000 enthusiasts took part in the Moscow Bicycle Festival on Sunday and raced around the center of the Russian capital. The festival started with a competition between semi-professional cyclists from various countries including Germany, Spain, UAE and others. The athletes could choose different distances making 3 to 7 rounds in the city's central circle, Sadovoye Ring. Meanwhile, Bayern Munich players parted hard on Saturday evening, celebrating a record-extending 7th consecutive Bundesliga title after crushing Eintracht Frankfurt 5-1 to finish two points ahead of Borussia Dortmund. The Bavarians, who will secure a domestic double if they beat RB Leipzig in the German Cup final on May 25th, have now won the German league title a record 29 times. With two points separating Bayern and Dortmund going into the final match day, the Bavarians were in no mood for any mishaps, considering they had squandered a chance to wrap up the title last week when they drew at Leipzig. Bayern's Robert Lewandowski was crowned the league's top scorer for the fourth time with 22 goals. For Di Petalio, UNTV News and Rescue. For the second year in a row, the world's happiest country is Finland. While the Philippines ranks among the happiest countries, it's the world improves. Mon Hoxon explains why. Many have defined the meaning of happiness. Happiness is associated with a lot of things like wealth, health, companionship, and security. Many institutions and reports have attempted to rank the happiest countries in the world, and one of this is the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network's World Happiness Report. The UNTV News team went to different countries all over the world to let you know who ranked as the happiest nation in 2019. Ghana in Africa steps up to the 98th spot from the 108th last year. 
We are Ghanaians and we rank 98 among the happiest countries in the world. Yay! Yay! Malaysia falls down to the 80th spot from its 35th place in 2018. Hi, I'm Anna from Malaysia. We are ranked 80 in the most happiest country in the world. <laughs> People in Hong Kong are becoming less happy as its rank drops 5 places to the 76th place. Hi, my name is Karen and I'm Chinese. I'm very happy. Hong Kong is ranking 76, the happiest country in the world. But the Filipinos have become merrier. From its 71st place last year, it is now in the 69th place. Ako ay Pilipino at ika pang anim na putsyam kami na bansa na pinakamasayang bansa sa buong mundo. Hep hep hooray! Russians are happier by just one point from the Filipinos. They are in the 68th place. Я из России, а Россия занимает 68 место среди самых счастливых стран мира. South Koreans are now in 54th place on the list of the happiest country in the world this year. I'm Korean. We Korean rank 54th among the happiest country in the world. Thailand falls six steps down. Last year, they were in the 46th place, but they are in the 52nd place on this year's ranking. Singaporeans have retained their spot in the 34th place. They are the second happiest country in Asia based on the report. I'm a Singaporean and we are ranked 34th among the happiest country in the world. Cheers. Brazilians are in the 32nd spot. Oi, tudo bem? Eu sou brasileiro. Estamos no 32º lugar dos países mais felizes do mundo. Aê! Taiwan leads all Asian countries in the 25th spot based on the happiness report. I'm a Taiwan Taiwan is the world's highest country. The United States of America, also known as the land of opportunity, is in the 19th place. I'm from Hawaii, USA, and we rank the 19th happiest country in the world. Mahalo! The Irish people are not so happy as they fall two places from their position last year. Ireland places 16th this year. Take wish! I'm Izzy, and I'm Irish. We rank the 16th most happy country in the world. Girl, Mila Mahabad. Lovely! Australians are also becoming less happy. From being top 8 in 2018, they've been shipped out from the top 10 countries, placing 11th this time. Hello UNTV, my name's Robert, uh, I'm an Australian, of course. Um, we are ranked as 11th um, amongst the happiest countries in the world. Thank you. From the 7th spot last year, Canadians now rank 9th on the list. We are Canadian and we rank ninth. We, we are Canadian, Canadian and we rank ninth among the happiest countries in the world. Considered as having the sexiest accent in the world, people in New Zealand are now the eighth happiest. We are the eighth happiest country in the world. The Netherlands climbs one place higher. From the sixth place in 2018, it claims the fifth. And for two consecutive years, Finland is the world's happiest country, based on the UN report. Congratulations! Moi, I'm Yesi, and I'm from Finland, and we rank first the happiest country in the world. Woohoo! The United Nations Happiness Report is a study they conduct every year. But the true meaning of happiness is not measured by wealth or prosperity, but is gauged by being content with what we have in life. Mon Hokson, UNTV News and Rescue. The Game of Thrones is finally over and a bakery in New York City is helping its fans to get through it. Abby Valdez will tell us why. Let them eat cake. Ahead of the Game of Thrones finale, Bakeries in New York City are offering sweet treats to tempt hardcore fans of the television series. Inside Sprinkles, the lemon dragon fruit cupcake with ice blueberry buttercream frosting was selling as fast as it was being put on the shelves. 
selling for $4.95 a piece in most stores, a continuous line of customers waited to devour the cupcakes like a Targaryen dragon devours its enemies. The reaction's been overwhelming from the moment we opened to now. It's just non-stop. As soon as we can get them out, they're going up. The bakery is also selling cupcakes featuring the crest of the Warring Noble Houses. Across town at NYK, Lisa Mansour is offering dragon eggs standing 20 centimeters tall and 5 inches wide. The vanilla cake filled with Belgian chocolate ganache is covered in green hand-painted sugary dragon scales. So they take a lot of work but they're super fabulous and it will be a fabulous centerpiece for your table for your party. Each handmade dragon egg costs $125. Game of Thrones cupcakes are also available. Meanwhile, while some fans felt satisfied by the show's final bow, others were quick to express their displeasure with how events unfolded. Well, I think it absolutely tied up. I think it ended well. I thought it would be more of a, like a dramatic ending. I thought I was going to see John be king of, you know, of everything. I didn't expect Daenerys to die. Like, I guess because we all thought she was going to die. I didn't think she was going to die, especially so soon in the episode. I don't know. I'm mad. I'm mad that this is the last episode. I wish that there was more after this. The series finale of the HBO fantasy drama was aired on Sunday, May 19. Abby Valdez, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this May 20th, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo. And before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Well, continuous naman yung pag-iimbestiga sa kanila. And uh, as the, the SILG have said, pag merong nakitang mga ebidensya laban sa kanila, they'll be uh, filed uh, cases, both criminal and uh, administrative. As far as we're concerned, he showed his disinterest in further serving the executive branch. Then, who are we to stop him? For unknown reason, which is still the subject of uh, further investigation through a fact-finding which is being instructed by the administrator, bumalaw yung uh, supposedly na sirana trend. So, ang priority namin ay uh, pinag-usapan namin doon ang ENDO. Tatapusin na namin yung ENDO for our Filipino workers. Uh, also, amendments to the uh, anti-terror bill, yung Human Security Act. Uh, para sa ganun, lalo na kami sa mga taga Mindanao, gusto na namin pumawala o malift ang martial law at yan ang hinihingi ng ating military leaders na ma-amend po natin yung uh, Human Security Act. And then we'll also prioritize the wire, anti-wiretapping act amendments. Ang presidente, pag hindi nyo nakikita, nagtatrabaho yon ayaw na i-storbo yun. Kasi pag, pag nasa labas siya, Ang daming gustong makausap sa kanya, di ba? Kaya napakabait nga naman taon, hindi naman tumatanggi.